Hello and welcome to Crime Watch Daily Updates. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. 19-year-old Faith Hedgepeth had everything going for her. She was a bright student at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and on her way to becoming the first in her family to graduate from college. Then one night in September of 2012, the college sophomore's future was taken away in the blink of an eye. At around midnight on September 7th of 2012, Faith and her roommate met up with some friends at a local bar. Last time Faith was believed to have been alive was back at her apartment at about 4.30 a.m. By 11 the next morning, Faith was dead. Faith had been beaten to death. She was found hanging off her bed. She was naked from the waist down, and her shirt had been pulled up. Investigators found DNA evidence at the scene, including semen on Faith's body. Detectives questioned several people and took DNA samples of people she knew, but nothing ever came back as a match. The case went cold. So then in 2014, Chapel Hill police released new information about Faith's murder, including a note that was written on a paper bag left next to her body that said, quote, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. Then a major break in the case happened in September of 2021 when police arrested Miguel Enrique Salguero Oliveras. Police linked Miguel to Faith's killing using DNA from a rape kit a palm print that was left on a wine bottle and the paper bag with the note on it. Miguel is incarcerated at the Durham County Jail on first degree murder charges, and he's being held without bail awaiting trial. Now, let's look back at the case of a promising teen who was killed before she could ever reach her full potential. Her last picture, this would be right before she got murdered. You could say that Roland Hedgepeth's home is a museum dedicated to faith. That was the name of his beloved daughter, a name that fills his walls, his shelves, and his everyday thoughts. Faith was the light of my life. Uh, She was born at a really tough time during my life. And uh, I have always thought that She was just a gift from God to give me a reason to live. To this day, he still saves the last voicemail he ever received from her. And I love you a lot. And I guess I'll talk to you later. Bye. Faith Hedgepeth, a beautiful young woman, a promising student, and much loved by her family and her Native American Haliwa Saponi tribe in North Carolina. She was a very lively person, just friendly uh, to everyone. I just want to give to people, give back to her community. She loved people. At 19 years old, Faith was aiming to be the first of her family to graduate college and lived in an off-campus apartment near the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. She dreamed of becoming a doctor, but she never made it. Faith was brutally murdered here in an apartment she shared with a friend by a killer who is still on the loose. And after three years, this case is still shrouded in mystery, leaving lots of questions and plenty of theories. It is one of the most horrific crimes in the history of this college town. It's been very hard um, learning of how Faith died. She was beaten. She was bludgeoned to death. A lot of people don't understand what that means, but it's, it was really bad. Leaving her family in stunned sorrow and disbelief. I don't know how I even functioned after I heard, after I got the news, all I remember was crying uh, uncontrollably for a long time. For Faith Hedgepath, it began as a typical busy day of classes on the UNC campus, and it drew to a close as college nights often do. First, a stint at the library with her friend and roommate, Karina Rosario, and then off to the local hangout just after midnight, a club called The Thrill. The two friends stayed until closing time. Crime Watch Daily investigator Billy Jensen has followed the story since day one. They meet up with uh, a bunch of guys, they're dancing, but then at one point, Karina says that uh, she doesn't feel good. She says she has a stomach ache. So they go home, back to their apartment. 
According to Faith's friend Karina, the two arrived back at their apartment about 2.30 a.m. Roland says that Karina told him she was sick from drinking a bit too much. Faith helps her and then falls asleep on the bed. Two hours later, Karina is picked up by a friend and leaves Faith alone in the apartment. But when she returns about 11 a.m., the place has been transformed into a bloodbath. Zara 911, where is your emergency? Hi, um, I just walked into the apartment and my friend just like, he's unconscious. He's unconscious, I just walked in the apartment and there's looks like there's blood okay, everywhere. Okay, listen to me. When you touch me, how does she feel? Does she feel what? warm? No, she feels cold. She feels cold? Okay. Yes. Okay, all right, don't touch anything yes. else, okay? Police soon arrive to a horrific scene. They find Faith lying face up, her head sort of halfway uh, off the bed, a pool of blood underneath her head. She's naked from the waist down, and she has a black T-shirt that's sort of pulled up over her head. Detectives begin the painstaking task of securing the crime scene, and then they make the painful calls to Faith's parents, who are divorced and live separately within a few hours' drive of Faith's apartment. I said, no, she's not dead. I said, you probably got the wrong person. She's not dead. And she said, yes, she's dead. Of course, I dropped the phone. I put my head down and I cried. And I said, no, not my baby. Connie told me that I needed to come to Chapel Hill, that uh, the police had found Faith dead. I don't remember a whole lot after that point, other than I lost it. Police tell the family that they are still working the crime scene, and the family believes the killer will soon be caught. When it, everything happened, I just, I mean, I just believed and trust that, in, that it was gonna be solved quickly. And of course, you know, you know, it went on a few months and by December, I just come to realize, hey, I, this is not gonna happen. That unthinkable day where you had to bury your sister, did you make any promises to her? I just told her that I loved her. I actually said uh, how sorry I was that this had happened to her. But weeks and months and finally years go by with no resolution. And with police keeping the investigation tightly under wraps, the unsolved murder draws national attention with journalists clamouring for the release of more information. Uh, they haven't released the entire um, medical report and they're holding a lot of things close to the vest. And some, like Faith's older sister, Rolanda, believe the killer may still be very close and still in Chapel Hill. I believe she knew her killer. I don't think even the meanest person in this world could do to a stranger what was done to her. It was very personal. No one ever convinced me otherwise. In the days following the shocking murder of 19-year-old Faith Hedgepeth, police are hard at work looking at every possible person of interest in the case. If anyone was in the area and saw something that they thought no matter how insignificant, might have a connection and we hope that they would come forward. But the $40,000 reward for information leading to an arrest in the case is still unclaimed. According to police reports, evidence here from the murder scene indicates that Faith may well also have been sexually assaulted. One of the many people the detectives questioned was Eric Takoy Jones. Jones, who was an aspiring rap artist at the time and a former boyfriend of Faith's roommate, Karina Rosario, told ABC 11 in Raleigh, Durham, quote, I'll be honest with you, whoever did this deserves to burn. Jones is also quoted as saying, from what I knew of her, she was the sweetest person in the world. If you needed her and she could do it, she was there. But according to police reports, the relationship between Eric and Karina was deeply troubled in the weeks preceding Faith's murder. The police learned that a restraining order was actually issued against Takoy Jones by Rosario in July of that year. The basis of that restraining order was a domestic assault. In this incident, he had kicked two doors in the apartment off their frame. And as part of the investigation, they received several accounts of Rosario being seen with visible injuries to her body that were reportedly inflicted by this boyfriend. Faith reached out to help her friend and roommate during her difficult times with Eric. Faith 
took Karina to take out a restraining order. I think that very possibly the court may have had some ill feelings toward Faith for doing that. And shortly before Faith's murder, Eric Takoy Jones posted a disturbing message on his Facebook page, writing, Dear Lord, forgive me for all of my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. But the day after uh, the body was found, someone had called up Chapel Hill Police Department and said that they were a former roommate of Faith's. The former roommate stated that Hedgepeth told her that Karina's boyfriend hated her, meaning Hedgepeth, and told her that he was going to kill her if Rosario did not get back together with him. Eric willingly cooperates with police. His apartment and car are searched for evidence. He comes up clean on all counts, but he was not willing to talk to Crime Watch Daily about this case, telling our producer, I really don't have much to say about that situation. Everything spoke for itself, and that's why my name was cleared. Hope that works out for you, though. He cleared DNA. He was incredibly cooperative with the police. They had to have interrogated him up and down. I'd certainly like to know what he was apologizing for and what he was asking for forgiveness for. In addition to Eric, police tested the DNA of many other young men. Some of them were at the Thrill nightclub the same time as Faith and Karina on the night of the murder. But once again, no match is found. I've been told that some of the sports teams were tested. I've been told that uh, every male in the apartment complex was tested. Some of the family, like Faith's sister, Rolanda, say they are still suspicious. I think just because someone was clear of their DNA doesn't mean they weren't the one who killed her. I believe someone who was tested is, pro is probably her killer. Complying with a Freedom of Information request, police finally released a trove of documents, many of them redacted with names blacked out. They had to release uh, a lot of documents and we have some more information, but uh, because they're keeping a lot of other information behind closed doors, that's why you're gonna get people making theories. The Chapel Hill Police Department has declined an on-camera interview with Crime Watch Daily, but what is most disturbing to the family is not what they find in the new information, but what is missing. It was about two years before we got the autopsy results and I'm not quite sure why they won't exactly say she was raped. And discrepancies about the 911 call also have the family wondering. The police report says that Karina Rosario was with another young woman named Marisol Rangel when she discovered Faith's body. But the 911 operator seems to believe that Karina is alone in the room. You're doing all right. You're doing all right. Just stay on the I phone with me. the police. I just don't want you to be alone right now. Okay. Okay. You stay on the phone with me. Karina never alludes to the fact that there's anyone else there with her, nor do you hear anyone in the background. Uh, I mean, you would think, I guess, that, uh, that they both would have been hysterical and uncontrollable at that point as far as crying and, and things, uh, which wasn't the case. And Roland isn't the only one shocked. Crime Watch Daily found the downstairs neighbour she prefers to remain unidentified, but tells us she ran into Karina and Marisol minutes after they discovered Faith's dead body, and now she's making this revelation. That's one of the most haunting things about my walking out when I did. You would have never guessed the two girls had just discovered a crime scene certainly a murder, a brutal murder, and a roommate. I will never forget that. Marisol was softly crying. Karina was texting, just texting. Karina Rosario and Marisol Rangel did not respond to our request for an interview. Generally a 911 call is a call for, distress call for help for the victim. It seemed like more of a reporting than, than a cry for help. But that only scratches the surface of the Chapel Hill murder mystery. Mixed in with the stack of documents released by police is one that can only be described as a bombshell. Two years went by before we knew anything at all about the note that was left on the bed. The note said, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. 
Of all the evidence released in the senseless murder of Faith Hedgepeth, it is by far the most shocking and mysterious. A note in childlike handwriting left sitting by her lifeless body, scrawled on a crumpled paper bag reading, I'm not stupid, bitch, jealous. You don't often find a crime scene with a note, and a note this cryptic. This doesn't happen. The note has been in the possession of the Chapel Hill Police Department for three years. They are not saying if they ever had the handwriting analysed, but at Crime Watch Daily we found an expert to give it a good look over. Peggy Waller is a forensic handwriting examiner and private investigator. She has given evidence in nearly two dozen court appearances and has examined handwriting in thousands of cases. She put the Hedgepeth murder note under her microscope for Crime Watch Daily and came up with some revealing findings. What struck me was how clean the document is. The crime scene was pretty bloody. And there's nothing on this document. Looking at it, I would get the impression it was either written outside of the crime scene or it was written before, like a, a premeditation. The writing also indicates that it's written with what we call disguise. The writing was more or less written with a non-dominant hand. Peggy says that handwriting analysis cannot determine things like gender or age, but it can answer some important questions about who is doing the writing. When I look at block letters, the writer distances themselves from authority, is all about themselves. It's me, me, me even at the cost of someone else. She went over the note for Crime Watch Daily letter by letter, word by word. And Peggy says the true emotional state of the writer can be found back at the beginning of the note. The word and sentence phrase, I'm not stupid, is a hot push button factor. That's the, probably the most important thing said. This was a jealous person who was called stupid the person that said it, who is now deceased, has no way of repeating this person is stupid, which is another way to shut them up. That, that word really, really bothers that person. Um, personally, while I'm interviewing this person, I would use that word constantly, constantly. And you would get this person to unload on you. Crime Watch Daily has obtained an audio recording of what may be the final moments of Faith Hedgepeth's life. Police have had the voicemail for more than three years. Cops won't tell us if it's ever been analysed, but Crime Watch Daily found a forensic audio expert who specialises in, of all things, pocket dialed phone calls. The unsolved murder of Faith Hedgepeth has taken me, well, 800 miles north of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, here to Portland, Maine, where I'm about to meet with forensic audio expert Arlo West. Now, Crime Watch Daily has obtained exclusively what could be Faith's last recorded words. It was from a voicemail she left for a friend. It looks very much to be a pocket dial that could blow this murder case wide open. First, I wanted to know something about Arlo's qualifications. I've worked on hundreds, if not thousands, of cases where people have pocket dialed somebody. Arlo West has literally been involved in hundreds of cases, and his work was pivotal in the New Hampshire murder trial of Diana Saunders, now serving life in prison for her role in the killing of her boyfriend, David King, in 2008. They got recordings of her, but the recording device was placed underneath the seat of the car, so it was a horrible recording. Horrible, horrible. They had sent it to the FBI. They couldn't really help them with it. And uh, I actually got a, about 80% transcript out of this thing, and we got a homicide conviction. Equipped with state-of-the-art software and years of experience, Arlo has gone over every millisecond of Faith's voicemail for Crime Watch Daily. And you have been able to decipher something, is that correct? It is correct, yes. If you can peel back those layers of noise, you start to get a better picture of the dialogue that, that is contained in there, stuff that starts to make a little more sense. You are about to hear and see Arlo's results exactly as he gave them to us. There are many profanities that cannot be repeated on air. Arlo is about to make some explosive claims about what he hears on this voicemail that cannot be independently verified by Crime Watch Daily. I hear what I believe is 
uh, Miss Hedgepeth's cries for help. I think those are critical things. That's quite staggering if true. What you believe that we might be listening to is the actual final moments as the crime's being committed, as this young girl is about to lose her life. I would think that that's a good analogy of what I'm hearing in this recording, yes. Even there, what we're listening to, would you say that's screaming? Yeah, you can hear her emotive voice, the tone of her voice is, is clearly in pain. And like there, she says, let me go. Let me go, let me go, help me as well. Yeah. You can clearly hear what I believe is Faith, um, you know, pleading, she's being hurt. Okay. Being attacked. I hear at least two female voices. One would be Miss Hedgepeth. The second female voice is a very angry female. There's two, at least two males that I can hear on this recording. At least two. There's lines here, Arlo, to the effect of, I think she's dying. That is chilling. Do it anyhow. Which is absolutely chilling. My hands are on fire. Help. This, to me, this hands on fire would be the binding of the hands of some, somehow. I'll untie them. Her hands look like they're on fire. Yes. The official autopsy report does show contusions on Faith's hands. And then Arlo found this on the voicemail. It sounds like somebody's singing, rapping to be precise. Some might say this sounds like music in a nightclub, but Arlo says not so fast. What I'm hearing here is the melody of the T-Pain song, uh, what's it called, Booty Work. He's got a point. Just listen to the original track. So, da na 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 Okay, that's what this person is singing. But they're putting their own words to it. I think it just proves that this isn't T-Pain, first of all. Right. So we know we're not in a club listening to T-Pain song. Okay. And something definitely not in the original lyrics, the name Rosie. Just there. Faith, if we believe it to be her, is clearly either fighting for her life or in great pain. Mm -hmm. And then a few seconds later, someone starts singing a rap song. Would that be an attempt to mask her cries or pleas? And Arlo says it's what you don't hear that proves to him they are not in a nightclub. You don't hear anything else. You don't hear any drums. You don't hear any low-end bass. You don't hear any keyboards. You don't hear any musical content. You just hear a male voice rapping which I find kind of interesting because it happens a lot during the times when Miss Hedgepath seems to be crying out for help. Most shocking of all, the names Arlo says he's hearing in this recording. I hear the name Eric, clearly. I hear the name Rosie, clearly. How confident are you that you are hearing the name Rosie? Very confident. I would never put it in a transcript if I wasn't absolutely convinced that that's what's being said. There is one big problem with Arlo's findings. It's the timeline. Cops say Faith was killed after 4.30 in the morning. The date stamp on this voicemail is approximately three hours prior. Arlo claims the discrepancy comes from a known software glitch with certain phones at the time. iPhones were inherently problematic, time stamping. It's a known issue. It existed at that time frame. Despite the issue with the timeline, Chapel Hill Police did contact Arlo and asked him to send over what he had found. If it is Faith being murdered and captured in this recording, which I think it is, this is pivotal. It should be able to uh, solve this case. It is what it is. I didn't make this up. So with that kind of certainty from an expert with experience and success at criminal trial, we felt we had an obligation to the Hedgepeth family. Not just to play them these shocking results of Arlo West's voicemail analysis, but to come here, back to North Carolina, and play it for them in person. Hello guys, come on in.
This family has lived for years with only questions about the horrific murder of their daughter and sister, Faith Hedgepeth. Looking at my baby. Crime Watch Daily has brought together Faith's parents, Roland and Connie, and her brother and sister, Chad and Rolanda, in their home state of North Carolina. And now, for the first time, they might get some real answers, thanks to Arlo West, a forensic audio expert. Crime Watch Daily went to West in Portland, Maine, to get him to analyse the voicemail that may have recorded Faith's murder. Now, I'm bringing his findings to her family. This is one of the hardest things I've had to do, is kind of be playing you this, and as the family having to listen to this. So I want to make sure that you're comfortable to hear it. It is a heartbreaking moment of torture listening to Faith scream. But Faith's family needs to know what happened and why. Two minutes and 59 seconds of terror that has haunted Faith's father for years. I have listened to this for the last uh, 28 months now. Every week almost, sometimes I used to listen to it every day. I'm not crazy, I just uh, want to make sure of what I was hearing. Do you believe what you're listening to here is Faith being murdered? Yeah, I do. That there's a critical moment of this recording here where, and it's, it's so difficult for me to read out even the transcript to you, but I, there's the words, I think she's dying and do it anyhow. I feel like Faith's being restrained at that point based on what I'm hearing there, okay. <laughs> listening, listening to that, do you recognise Faith's voice? When she says, ow, I know it's Faith. And I have no... No doubt whatsoever. Faith's family cringing with every graphic, brutal detail. <laughs> There's the phrase, I can't believe you did it, Rosie. Well, what are your thoughts on that statement? <laughs> My initial impression is, from that statement is that the female herself has done something at that point to Faith. Either has hit her in the head or whatever. To me, it sounds like three against one. What do you think, Connie? What's going through my mind is she was being hurt and out of beaten, raped and abused, and nobody was there to help her. What are your thoughts to this point, Chad? I just can't help but think about the Chapel Hill Police Department right now and wonder what they've been doing for the past three years. If it is what we're hearing, she, I mean, she's a, she's a very brave girl, right? I know, she fought. She fought. And of course, she saw the bruises all over her head. And of course, her hands was, for me, the only thing that was recognizable. Despite three and a half long years, Faith's family still holds out hope that this case will be solved soon. And while we can't independently verify Arlo's analysis of the recording, they are hoping the voicemail will lead to the killer or at least bring a witness forward to at last achieve justice for Faith. We need that to be able to move on. It would mean the world? It would mean everything to us and a lot of people. A lot of people love Faith. A lot thoughts in the wake of having listened to, to that particular recording as well, Chad, are you hopeful that that might spark some new development in this case? If that doesn't help in some kind of way and, and move that needle, I don't know what will at this point. Chapel Hill Police have questioned more than a dozen people looking for Faith's killer. We've tried to talk to her roommate, Karina Rosario, who found Faith's body, and Rosario's former boyfriend, Eric Takoy Jones. Cops never charged either one with any wrongdoing, but Faith's family believes they may have some answers to solve the mystery behind Faith's murder. Karina did not respond to repeated requests for an interview with Crime Watch Daily. Eric did reply to our producer on Facebook when we asked him to talk to us on camera. He writes, honestly, I don't want nothing to do with that and I don't need that kind of attention while I'm in grad school. My lawyer doesn't think it's a good idea and wants your contact information. But we desperately wanted to talk to Eric, so I tried again to speak with him at his mother's home in Chapel Hill, where he is reportedly living. I was just hoping I might be able to have a really quick chat with you if you had a moment. 
I need for you to get off my property right now. Absolutely. Eric's not here to have a chat, ma'am. So you would have just seen there, we've made an attempt to speak to Eric. Uh, his mother has asked us in uh, no uncertain tone to get straight off the property, which we're about to do. We should also stress that we also reached out to Eric and through his attorney. So I guess that's where we leave it. But memories of their loving daughter will never leave the Hedgepeth family. Roland actually goes back to the apartment directly below Faith's and stands in the bedroom underneath where his beautiful daughter's body was found, desperately trying to keep some connection. I've only known you for a short time, but I can pretty confidently say I've never seen a father with greater love for a daughter. Tell me why you go and stand in the, in the apartment, in the bedroom below where she was killed. What do you do in those quiet moments with her? That's where her lifeblood was spilt, okay? Her last breath was, was, was breathed right above it. What do you say to her when you stand in that room? I tell her I'm sorry I wasn't there for her. 